Okay, thanks uh, for joining us for today's panel discussion about the accessibility and uh, recognizing invisible disabilities. Um, we are Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching from Stony Brook University. Let's introduce our three co-facilitators for today's session. Um, my name is Jenny Zen. I'm a senior instructional designer at the South. Let me pass to my colleagues. Uh, my name is Lise Colon. I am an instructional designer at South. I'm sorry, it was really hard to find the unmute button. <laughs> My name is Jenna Kim. I am a postdoctoral associate at, at CELT. Okay, so um, let's start with um, why, uh, the why CELT to host this kind of inclusive teaching conversation because we want to open the conversation focused on the excellent teaching through collaboration with instructors. And we also want to create a space for cross-disciplinary conversation about excellent teaching. And the inclusive teaching is excellent teaching. And also um, two housekeeping items, first one speaker at a time, and also, um, as I said, keep your camera off if you don't want to be recorded. And you can post your uh, question to the chat. We will, if we have time, we can adjust that at the end of the session. So now let's move on to our panelists. Um, we're gonna invite our panelists to introduce themselves. Let's start with Neil. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Butterkley. I'm an attorney and I'm an adjunct instructor in the College of Business at Stony Brook University. I think I'm next. I'm Sarah <laughs> Calderello. I am an accessibility support counselor at our Student Accessibility Support Center. Um, so basically, we handle everything related to accommodations for any student that discloses they have a disability on campus. Thanks. And hi, I'm Sharon Cuff. I teach in the health science department at Stony Brook. I am a social worker by training and I teach uh, scholarly writing in the fall. And then in our spring concentration, I teach two classes in disability studies and human development. Thanks. Next to Glenn. Hi, I'm Glenn Dausch. I'm the Web Accessibility Officer within the Office of Equity and Access for Stony Brook University, uh, focused on uh, ensuring that the products and digital services that we use are accessible to the widest possible audience. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Robert Patrick. I'm the Assistive Technology Coordinator for the Student Accessibility Support Center on campus. Um, basically, I run all of the technology through our department. So I give out all of the note-taking apps. I give out um, some of the readers. Um, and anything that goes through Assistive Tech goes through me. Thanks. And uh... yeah. yeah. <laughs> My name is Rich Schoolpin. I work for the Media Systems Engineering Group here at Stony Brook University. Um, basically, my role is to design and program the AV systems that are in all the registrar controlled classrooms. Uh, also, a few years back, uh, Glenn was nice enough to invite me to chair a uh, group that focused on the ADA classroom technology and design uh, that we basically the technology we want to build into our classrooms for accessibility. Thank you. So today's agenda, we would open with a uh, an activity called Word Cloud. Then we would uh, situate in the accessibility and uh, invisible disability conversations. Then we would uh, um, start with the panel questions. And the end, we would have Q&A. So let's start with um, the Word Cloud. Let's see. 
Luis maybe want to explain right, it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so what you're going to do is you're going to either scan the QR code or click on the link on the slides. Um, and you're going to answer just one question. It says, what words come to mind when you think of accessibility? Um, so again, do we have the slides in the chat? Maybe we... So I add the, uh, the slide I'll just add the yeah. Cool. All right. So you can click that link in the chat, and then you can answer that question. Let me... Slido is accepting answers. It looks like it's waiting for votes. Okay, cool. We're starting to get some. Definitely access. Inclusion, access, openness, universal design, UDL. Neurodivergent, belonging, unavailable. These are all great words, guys. Inequity, student, student oriented, removing barriers. We'll take about one more minute on that, and then we'll go over what are the most common answers that we came up with. All right, so it looks like inclusion is at the center, but other words that came up in a lot of the responses were universal design, UDL, equity, access, you know, student belonging and openness, as well as removing barriers. So these are all big parts of accessibility, and we'll talk a little bit more about accessibility um, with our panel discussion questions. So... So just some key terms for our discussion, um, inclusive pedagogy, it's providing a rich learning environment that increases learning opportunities and achievement of all students, you know, while also including them and safeguarding them, especially um, from just outright exclusion or marginalization. Accessibility refers to making anything, information, activities, or even the learning environment um, usable, inclusive, meaningful um, for as many people as possible. And invisible disabilities, which is also a part of this panel discussion, are disabilities, either mental or physical impairments that um, you might not readily be able to see or discern. So we'll get into our questions for our panelists. And the first question is, why is accessibility important to establish an inclusive classroom? And we'll open that up to our panelists now.
I can start. Um, I think that if you are aiming to create an inclusive classroom accessibility in all of its forms, I know we're going to be discussing some details as our session progresses. Um, I think that really just sets the tone of openness and inclusivity for the students. And um, it's almost just the beginning of where you start with your syllabus and getting your class ready. To follow on to what Sharon said, uh, accessibility has to be at the forefront of that, that planning process um, because we don't know who the students are. Um, in when we look at uh, particularly um, hidden disabilities, if we don't uh, plan to, to make our course content um, and our activities accessible, we may be inadvertently excluding students from participating um, Educause released a, a study about uh, three years uh, back that said um, over 40% of students do not identify uh, that they have a disability. And this happens for a number of reasons, but um, it's important to place that in the context um, of planning um, an inclusive environment. I would just add to that that if the classroom itself is inaccessible, then people with disabilities hidden or otherwise can't even get to the classroom. So you can have the world's best lesson plan. You can have everything scoped out. But if people can't physically get there, then you have a problem just at the start. Yeah, I'd like to just add that basically the way I see it is that the job of the instructor, they have this information that they want to disseminate to the students and they want the students to walk away with that so they can bring that to their life and their career and having accessibility at the forefront like was mentioned earlier kind of is another tool in that in that toolbox to help to that end goal of getting the information from you the instructor into the students so they can functionally use it and I wanted to go back to Glenn's point um, that talks about not, we won't always know which students are going to be there. And our, on campus here, our accessibility center is called SASE. So if you hear anyone talking about SASE, that's our student accessibility uh, center. And um, so we receive letters and notifications about which students have formally um, you know, requested and have had their accommodations approved for the classroom. And this is all types of disabilities. And I'm sure there are people from other campuses and, and your schools have something similar in place. So as uh, Glenn was saying, not all students go through that process. So you know the students who have the formal accommodation request is coming to you, but we are not aware of other students that are sitting in the classroom who could have disabilities hidden or otherwise who have not put in any requests. And we want to make sure that all of our content is available to all of our students. I can add to Sharon sitting on the sassy side. Um, we do, we meet with the students who disclose that they need accommodations. Um, but the biggest thing really that we face, especially at the start of a semester is the time. So if we know that a student is in an inaccessible um, classroom, it takes a little bit of time to move that classroom. We have to see what classrooms are available, um, logistically how we're going to make that work. It involves cross-department involvement, and all the while the student can't participate in the lecture or obtain the notes, and they really are being um, excluded from that material. So we try to work as fast as we can. Um, I wish we had a magic wand, but if the professor does, or even working with us, if we're able to have that conversation with the professor up front, we bypass a lot of the challenges that we come across later in the semester. Um, I would also add, when we're talking about an accessible or inaccessible classroom, some of it could be just simple as it wasn't necessarily designed to be accessible or not. Let's assume there's a classroom on the third, fourth, fifth floor of a building and the elevator is out and the elevator is out for an extended period of time due to school or state budgetary restrictions or it's an old elevator, you can't get parts. And all of a sudden a month can go by and unless people are able to walk two, three, four, five, six flights of stairs, you know, some people may be able to, some people have a hidden disability. Someone could have just had surgery or, or could have it, an issue that is not obvious to everyone else, but having a classroom on the fourth floor without a working elevator causes a problem. 
If I could jump in there for a second too, it's not only people with physical disabilities on this as well, maybe even someone who has some sort of sensory issue or um, any type of uh, mental health condition, they may get a little bit um, more scared to kind of go up those four or five flights of scares with a hundred other people. Um, if you have a class of two, 300 people, something like that, that's on a higher level with the elevator out, there's going to be a very, very crowded staircase there. So you can definitely have an, an issue like that as well. These are all great points, guys. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to the next question. So question two says, how do invisible disabilities influence or shape accessibility efforts? I can start with that one. Um, mm -hmm. For invisible disabilities, a lot of it, I, I always tell my students and, and faculty to not assume. A lot of times when a student either chooses to disclose or not disclose an invisible disability, they might they may or may not understand the full capacity of how it's impacting them. So when we're trying to develop accessibility efforts, it really takes a lot of um information gathering and kind of putting ourselves in that student's shoes to understand what they're dealing with. We may be looking at it as an outsider looking in and saying, well, this course looks accessible based on the syllabi. I've had conversations with the professors, but we're not feeling all of the environmental stimuli or gauging the interactions within the classroom. So, um, to not assume and to really take the time to get that feedback, I find that's the most important step in our job over here on the accommodation side. And to add to that, Sarah, I can really see um, when you talk about, you know, the kind of the part before where you're working on getting everything available. And the idea is you're not, I think it's very important to not wait uh, when you're preparing any aspects of your course content until you actually have a what you think is, quote, I'm putting air quotes, a student with a disability in your class, because you probably already have one. And so whether the disability is hidden or not, or if the student has registered with the accommodation program in your place or not, or SASE here, um, there, I think it's wise to anticipate that there already are students with disabilities sitting in your classroom. So maybe they have not requested an accommodation. Maybe they did not have one at high school. In high school, I know a lot of students with hidden disabilities, such as learning disabilities, who had accommodations in high school are reluctant to request them when they come to university. They feel like, okay, I took, kind of took care of that. We don't really have anything like resource room. So I'm just going to go and see how it how I can do. And a lot of times they struggle tremendously. So anticipate that regardless of the contact information you have about a student, you already have a student with a disability sitting in every class. And then ask yourself, and I try to you know, make sure I'm doing this, is my content available to people with all different types of disabilities, as well as where we talked about a couple you know, a couple of people have mentioned the environment. Um, so we we're talking about the content, we we're talking about the environment and every aspect that makes the uh, situation successful for a student. Just to follow on uh, what Sharon was so eloquently pointing out, um, you know, when we plan for an accessible curriculum and we, we plan to have accessible content in place at, at the outset, um, we're also planning to enhance learning outcomes for students um, because it, the accessible content allows students to engage with the material in the way that, that uh, allows them to demonstrate their uh, attainment of the knowledge and, and uh, course curriculum um, in a way that's going to um, best allow them to engage with the material. So um, it's really important to have um, those universal design concepts down from, uh, you know, from the start. And typically, universal design benefits everyone. So, you know, you can go to the store and there's a ramp and that's wonderful for somebody with uh, mobility impairment and they're using the ramp and so are people with strollers and so are people uh, pushing grocery carts. Um, and I think it's the same in the classroom that some of the efforts that we put into 
formally make our content accessible and manageable for students with disabilities to students who may not have a disability, but just don't have uh, the same strength or skill set that other students have can benefit from some of those other efforts as well. I would also add that on universal design, I mean, we got to think in terms of not just we have the curriculum and how we're going to present material, how what the class is made of and how the materials are presented to the students, but also about how students get to the class. Uh, I know I mentioned the issue of, let's say you have an elevator, someone with an obvious disability, if they're on in a wheelchair, you need the elevator if you're going to go up to like four flights. But someone could have had surgery and be on and have braces or have braces covered by their clothing and you won't know it, or someone could have a heart condition or a lung condition and it's not obvious and it could be permanent or temporary. So we have to focus on physically getting the students into the classroom, wherever it is, and which includes making sure the buildings work properly and then having an inclusive, the room itself be inclusive and then have the curriculum be inclusive and have the approach be inclusive. And for those of you who can't see, I talk with my hands, but the camera doesn't pick it up. I know from a classroom design point of view, you know, we always strive to, based on the technologists, we deal with what technology can we add to the room so it's already there, someone doesn't have to bring it in, um, and kind of just keep to those standards. And as um, something may be helpful to add, we have to stay open to hearing what potentially we can bring into the classroom that even if it just helps one or two people kind of, as I was talking about before, internalize that information that the instructor is giving out. Um, that's definitely something that we strive to continue to do. And Melissa Kate just had a great point in the chat um, and talking in case people didn't see it, she's saying about how um, as a deaf person, the, uh, the captions are so important, but lots of people benefit from captions. Um, so that's a great point, Melissa Kate. And we don't want to wait until we have a student that we get notification like, OK, now we have a student who's hard of hearing or deaf. Let me work on my videos now. Absolutely not any content that you are planning to deliver that we, we this is how we do it. We're planning to deliver content. We wanna make sure that content is accessible to the students. And I have a video in one class that has no, um, it just has some music in the background. And so now I've had it, um, I have a, a, a d visual description so that if I had a student with a visual impairment, uh, they would hear the music, but they would then be able to have, um, the content, which is only visual available to them as well. So great point, Melissa Kate, thank you. If I could jump in here for a second as well. Um, one of the things that I see the most in my position um, is inaccessible documents from professors. Um, and I think it's something that can be changed really, really easily. Um, one of the most common things that I see is maybe if there's a homework or something that's going on, is uh, professors even scanning um, textbook pages, which aren't allowed to be put through a reader or any type of software at that point, since it's just a standard picture at that point. Um, that's such an easy little change that can be made super, super easily, running it through even like a text program or um, finding a PDF online of that can make um, a student's um, homework, uh, essay, uh, exam, anything much, much easier for them if they are able to run it through those types of software um, for those specific disabilities. I want to point out if there's any faculty on board. It it does seem like we're saying, oh, these are all the things you have to do. You're not expected to know these things. I think that there's a question later on where um, we speak to the benefit of interdepartment collaboration. Part of our job at SASE is that faculty outreach. Because if you notice that a student is struggling or you're thinking about making something more inclusive, reach out because we might have these ideas. And like Robert said, it's easy. It's super easy. And you know that you're now making your class more accessible for hopefully everyone that walks in through that door. These are all great points. Thank you. And thank you for participating in the chat. Definitely continue to do so for our participants. Uh, we'll move to the next question.
All right, so the next question is, what advice would you give to instructors to recognize invisible disabilities and design an accessible course for students? And the question is also in the chat now. I think Sharon mentioned this at the start, but really it starts with your syllabi. Um, that is the first document and usually students get it before they even walk into your classroom. We want that to be as concrete and concise and clear as possible because a student with an invisible disability, whether it be a learning disability, autism, um, ADHD, they're going to receive all of these different syllabi. And if they have a uniform way of viewing them, it makes it a lot easier for them to then prepare for those classes. Um, so that's usually a, a trick that we tell the professors, make your syllabus less wordy and more concise to what you expect um, for your students. Similarly, to give any examples, um, I know for our, our students in writing courses, the professor may or may not give any sort of rubric. That's really difficult for a student with an invisible disability because they don't know what's expected. They don't know what good work or, or quality work looks like. So really giving those tangible references um, can make a really big difference for students. One of the big things, oh, sorry, <laughs> um, just kind of bouncing off of that with um, some of the rubrics and maybe some of the essays. One of the things that I even saw at my time at Stony Brook as a student um, was some professors kind of going through essays where it's very, very generalized, where it's like you can pick your own topic, you can kind of find out whatever you want to do. And even having a large, large um uh, choices like that can be really, really detrimental to some students. Having some sort of rigid structure where it's maybe something of this topic or that topic, um, maybe even a little bit better for them. If it's too much of a broad, um, broad choice, that can be uh, definitely a little bit um, intimidating to some students as well. And jumping off both of those points, I think that a lot of um, how I try to approach some of the points in the classroom is more like this is the start of a conversation. And on the first day when I'm reviewing the syllabus with the students, I talk about if a student has a disability, have they already registered? But if not, and you feel that you, you need more support, you know, we're here and you can contact them or you can talk to me first or you know, just reach out to people. <clears throat> and then I do check in a couple of weeks into the semester and I say, okay, this is how how I'm doing the class, is it working for you? Or, you know, and if it's not working for you, please come and see me. Um, so that the students understand that, you know, it's not just checking the box at the beginning, it's really just part of how we're working together. And again, approaching teaching from an inclusive standpoint, you're going to capture everyone. So you might not have somebody who, you know, has their identified disability or has a hidden disability, or maybe they haven't even realized they have a disability yet themselves. Maybe they are experiencing anxiety in the classroom and they're just kind of seeing how it's coming and impacting them. And maybe they sort of shut down when part of the lecture is going on. So a lot of little checkpoints that can be very simple. They can be little announcements to the class. Hey, if it's not going well, please reach out to me or at the end of class. And I know those are a lot of approaches that people do anyway. So it, a lot of these points can be things that you're already doing in your classrooms. Just to jump in there for a second as well. Um, in our office, we see things like this all the time. We have students registering throughout the semester. We have students registering now, two weeks away from finals. Um, we have students that register in their sophomore year, junior year, senior year. You can register two weeks before you graduate. Um, it really doesn't necessarily matter when you register. register. Um, it's about getting the help that you need for what you need it for. You know, to follow up on, on both Robert and, and Sharon's excellent points, you know, uh, when we spoke before about uh, temporary disability, dis disability can occur at any time. So it's really important not to, you know, think of this as, as something that is either time-based or, you know, uh, has to be in place at the beginning of the semester. Um, you know, and, and Sharon, uh, you really, um, I, I want to emphasize what you brought up about um, having that conversation with students, um, not only at the beginning of the semester, but throughout the, the semester. Um, another colleague of ours uh, would often um, 
put that phrase on the syllabus to say, I'm, I'm here to have that conversation with you in, in whatever way works best for you, whether it's an email or whether it's showing up to office hours and having that conversation in person. Um, it, it's giving the students the ability to see that they have uh, agency in that process and, and being able to guide that conversation um, is really important. I think the communication is great. I know for me, um, when I first design, started designing classrooms, I could tell you how big a screen should be, how bright a projector should be. And then I really started to educate myself on some of the things that come into the classroom with regards to disabilities. And sometimes even a small tweak or change or a piece of equipment in the classroom um, that's really nominal, not that much to add, would make such a large difference, like having an extra audio output at a lectern that someone can bring in their own device and plug into a normal headphone output and that can transmit in a way they're used to receiving uh, information and, and things like that. So really educating yourself um, and seeing what changes you can make as, as we've been discussing here, and then just having that constant communication uh, with your student base and your other coworkers and faculty. That was great, thank you. If there's nothing else for that question, we'll move on to the next one. Our fourth question says, how and why is it important for faculty to tap into various supports available at the university to create an inclusive learning experience? I love this question because I think that if there's one thing that predicts student success, it's the amount of engagement they have in both the Canvas community and also in their academic courses. Um, there's different experts in different things throughout campus. So really when we work with our students, we're the accommodation experts. Sometimes we refer them to our student support team if they have any financial um, difficulties or even just extenuating circumstances that need more immediate care. We have the tutoring center and now we have learning specialists that specify in teaching students with different learning styles. Um, a lot of times students feel heard and validated simply by having a meeting with us at TASI and their professors. And it's probably the easiest thing for us to do because most of the time the dialogue is between the student and the professor. They just come to us because they need that, that extra reassurance. So ideally we know we're doing our job if students are out there reaching out to other departments um, for support and it gives them an empowered feeling. They kind of take control of their success and realize that disability is not everything. They're a student and part of the campus community first and foremost. I would like to add to something Sarah said. It's from a professor point of view, it's like we don't know what we don't know. And there's all these, as to paraphrase some older politicians, the, the great unknowables. Um, and I think by reaching out to the people who are experts in this area, we have an ability to learn more things too and figure and help us figure out how to reach and deal with students who have uh, uh, additional needs. And when I saw that question, I thought, oh, that Sarah's going to love that question. Um, and I think everything, you know, that uh, we're talking about is that the same thing is uh, people have different ideas. And if our focus is on uh, our content, they might not be having as much experience or understanding that, hey, this really worked for one person or this worked better for somebody else. And just that collaboration that's so important in everything we do. So it carries over to making our uh, classrooms, our content, and ourselves to result in a whole university that's more inclusive, creating it a culture. Um, you know, one of the, oh, nope. sorry, Robert, go ahead. But it'll be a quick point, don't worry. Um, I just wanted to jump in and basically say, um, we want you guys to reach out to us. We want to talk about this because we don't want people assuming um, that they know exactly what they're doing when it comes to it, if they don't. Um, we want you guys to reach out and find out exactly how to do something. We want to go through it with you and make sure that uh, everything is being done 
happen properly um, and that there um, everything is going to be good for that student specifically. Um, we don't bite. <laughs> I, I think it's a really, really good thing whenever a professor reaches out to me and wants to go over things like this because it's a learning experience on both sides. I don't know everything that goes on in the classroom and a professor may not know everything that goes on in our disabilities office or with these accommodations. So I think it's a good learning experience for everyone when it comes to this type of thing. You really um, honed in on, on an important point, Robert, and that is that it, expertise is really, we understand a topic, but it also means we understand where the gaps are and we're never done learning, right? This is uh, particularly important for us in higher education. Um, and so it, it's a, an experience that we all share and we wanna keep working together. Um, you know, so I wanna highlight a, a few uh, really key resources. Um, you know, first and foremost, CELT, thank you for hosting this conversation. Um, but CELT is a great resource for faculty who want to deepen that conversation around uh, inclusive pedagogy. Um, and uh, for faculty, as we discussed earlier, um, disability can occur at any time, not just for our students, but for our faculty and staff. And so um, faculty who want to discuss an accommodation uh, for themselves uh, can do so through uh, my office. So stonybrick.edu slash OEA, um, it will get you to the right place. So thank you. All right, so we'll move on to the next question. There's nothing else. And as Jenna said in the chat, this is one of the questions that we received from registrants. Um, Sorry, sharing hiccup. No worries. Um, and now this question's in the chat as well. The question says, how are recent developments on long COVID impacting our dialogue on invisible disabilities? So I, I want to take a, a step back and, and look at this conversation or look at this question through a, a broader lens. And that is to say, how has, has COVID and, you know, up through long COVID um, impacted uh, our learnings. Uh, and I think that the first point is really to say that um, looking at the way we, we teach, the way we operate, the, the, all of our processes, um, building in that flexibility is important. We had to, four years ago, had to make a, a change on a dime um, and what once seemed impossible was all of a sudden possible. And we made that happen. Um, let's not lose sight of, of those um, learnings that took place uh, through all that difficult work. Um, you know, uh, moving forward into how long COVID uh, imp impacts this conversation. Um, it's it's being aware that we don't know what's going on, regardless of, of what we can see when we walk in the classroom. Um, going back to the, the point, and I, I think it was Sharon that made the point earlier, um, you, you can't tell just by walking in the classroom how your students, uh, you know, who your students are. Um, start there. Understand that we only know uh, what our students are able to tell us. Or, um, and so building in that flexibility as you're developing your course is gonna be essential for allowing those students to succeed. Um, I would like to add to this from a slightly different perspective. So in addition to being an adjunct professor, I'm also, I come from the corporate legal world. And what I noticed at Stony Brook 
you know, once COVID hit and then with the return to the classrooms is similar to what I've also noticed in the corporate environment is in the old, it used to be that if someone was sick pre-COVID, they'd show up in class, they'd show up in a corporate environment, they'd sneeze and cough all over everybody, or they constantly run out of room because they're going to throw up or something, they're not feeling well, and they there's a chance of infecting everyone around them. Then they go on staircases, elevators, subways, mass transit, and get coughed on, cough on other people. I know, and then there was sort of an attitude of, oh, well, you're sick, so just sort of like show up anyway. I think now, post-COVID, I see a, a change in attitude. People seem to be recognizing the fact that their illness or COVID or whatever, flu or what other sickness that they have, it could be contagious and could transmit onto someone else. So people automatically are being, I'll call it more polite or more conscious of the need to not infect other people with COVID, the flu, a, a cold or something else, and are staying out of class, you know, letting the professor know, or working remotely in a corporate setting, or asking to meet remotely in a school setting. So I, I sense there's an attitude about it's acceptable and preferred and healthier to not go in when you're sick and cough all over people. I think from the student perspective, a lot of our students may not even realize they have lingering effects from COVID because right now it's you like like Neil said, you stay out for a little bit, you you tell your professors, you make up that work, but then students may still suffer from chronic fatigue or brain fog or all of these other lingering effects, and they may not call it a disability, and they may say, you know, why am I struggling? So it's one of those things where the more um, conversation that happens about it, we we always try to kind of scratch at the surface when students are reporting things like this, because most times they. They say, well, I had COVID a month ago. And we're like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> All right. Um, and then we have a little bit more to work with. So I think most times students may undermine what they're really feeling when accommodations at that point, even provisional, can really be a huge benefit for those students. If I could just add on to that again, I think it's part of this post-COVID is attitude changes. And also, wrecking, it's not just you know, what Sarah was saying, and it may not know what you're having, and then you realize you had COVID. It's not just re recognizing that maybe I don't want to go into the class or into the gym and cough and sneeze all over everybody, but also recognizing that long COVID or just having COVID and the lingering effects are different. Some people will cough, and that's visible. Some people's impact of COVID on them is, and this happened to me, for three weeks, I had to take a nap for three hours in the middle of the day. All of a sudden, I would fall asleep. Other people would be just exhausted or foggy or different things. So the COVID effect on others is different and people are accepting the fact that it's different and accepting the need to like, well, I don't need to infect someone else. So I'll just be away for a few days. So I think it's an attitude change for a, 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 arguably in a stressful society. It's a politeness sort of thing that's sort of transpired. I don't remember exactly where I read this, but I remember somebody likening some of these um, post-COVID symptoms to almost like post-concussion symptoms, um, where if you get a concussion, you may have lingering effects on that for two, three, four months after that. Um, I remember reading somewhere of someone likening it to them, and I uh, honestly, it made me think about it in a little bit of a different light as well. I think it's also really important, you know, when we talk about how differing these experiences are, um, to recognize that no two people are going to experience the same thing, and no two people are going to experience even the if they are they are experiencing the same thing, it's not going to impact them the same way. Um, and so, giving yourself the time and and space, whatever the case may be, uh, is really important. It's it's one thing for attitudes to change, um, but sometimes we're the hardest on ourselves, right? And so um, making sure that uh, as, as faculty, when we're having those conversations with students, we're allowing them to understand that there is uh, the space to have that conversation and, and to, if they uh, you know, need, there is a process to work through in order to ensure that those accommodations are in place for them if need be.
All right, great. Thank you for all the responses. I think we have one last question that was submitted by our um, by our registrants. So last question says, what are a few actionable steps that faculty instructors can take to begin making their courses more inclusive and accessible? I think on that one, we've kind of touched on it along the way. But I think really starting again with um, don't wait for a student with a disability to formally to think that you have a, you, you need a SASE accommodation to think that you have a student enrolling in your course. Look at your content. Is it available in multiple ways? If you had people who had any different types of disabilities, are, you know, is your content ready? Do you have your captions? Do you have your descriptions? Um, what we talked about with the um, the information being able to go through the readers, um, looking at it from that universal design right from the beginning. So maybe um, you're new and you're just starting to teach and that's wonderful. You can start off right that way, but maybe like many people here, you're, you're midway, you know, but it's okay. Just start now. Start with the next um, class that you teach. Last year, I went to um, sell to host so many wonderful events, and I went to a full day inclusive um, pedagogy uh, event, uh, which I went to this year, but I went to the one last year. And one of the recommendations they had was about creating skeletal lecture note uh, formats for students. And I, like most of the information I get from CELT, I go to something on Friday and Monday I start implementing it because their ideas are so um, actionable. And when I opened up my course this year, I saw that I, my lecture, my skeletal lecture notes started at like week nine, because that's when I went to the event last year. And I just made a couple for the end of the semester. So when I started my class in January, I only had to do a couple in the beginning. And that was a great um, example. And that it was not folk. That conversation was not focused on inclusivity for uh, students with disabilities. It was just focused on in inclusive classroom and teaching, all, you know, in general. So that was one thing I've taken away. Also, making these notes, and then I see students using them. It's, it's similar to how we do it with slides. Um, if the students want to print out slides and keep the notes associated with the slides, but the recommendation had been to sort of create an outline and then leave some blank space for the student to be able to discern which is the important information and how am I going to add more to it. And students are using them. I think a simple change or, or approach that we often suggest to professors is for everything that you verbally explain or directions given during lecture to put it in a quick email following the, the class. Written communication is really, really important. I know myself, I live on post-its. There's post-its everywhere because if something's not written down, it's out of, you know, it's out of my mind. But for our students, a lot of times having that reference material, they can go back and make a checklist of what they need to do. They also then have your contact information. Some of our students struggle simply with that initiation and asking for help. It makes it a little bit more approachable when they already have have your email and can reply. Um, so written communication is easy and it's very beneficial. Uh, one thing I'd like to bring up is just, it spurred my brain from the COVID question before is uh, lecture capture. So a lot of our classrooms are outfitted with the ability to do lecture capture and we've had it for 10 plus years here, but COVID kind of really made a uh, resurgence of that. And it offers multiple features such as captioning, um, extra time for a student to go back and review what actually happened on the lecture. And it doesn't have to be released to everyone. I know there are professors that will record their classes and never release them unless there's a specific student that has an incident where they might need it. Um, that's up to the professor. And there's definitely resources uh, you can get through Self and Sassy to figure out how to kind of do that stuff. But I definitely see that as a valuable resource for the instructors. One point that I'm going to harp on um, is going to be just creating accessible learning materials. I think it's super, super important to have those, whether it's captions, whether it's um, uploading PowerPoints or PDFs of everything, um, whether it's any of these things. I, I think it's super, super important um, having accessible learning materials for your students, whether they have a disability or don't. And I know that sometimes, you know, when we hear create accessible materials that, that can sound overwhelming, right? There's there's a lot that goes into that conversation. But to Sharon's point, start. Take that first step. 
um, and it, it becomes easier the, the more you do it. Um, and once you have a process in place, it, it almost uh, becomes uh, templatable, right? You, you just, you're taking these same actions over and over. Um, taking that first step is, is very often the most difficult part. Um, so pick that first, first goal. You, you just want to work on section one of lecture one, start there. And, and you can build on a process to, to move forward. Um, I also would say accessibility means being available to the student and not necessarily, and depending upon it, whether you have an office, you don't have an office or you're meeting, be able to meet in different locations on the campus so a student can reach you or be on Zoom or before or after class and just making yourself available. So to me, accessibility also means availability. All right, this was great. Thank you to our panelists. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jenna, who's going to make some announcements. Thank you, everyone. This was a wonderful conversation. Um, we have a, about eight minutes left. So if, if our um, participants have any questions, you're more than welcome to utilize the chat at this point and ask some questions to our panelists. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to share some of the resources we have available. We have a, a LibGuide created um, for everyone, and this has some related materials to today's topic. Uh, we also added some Stony Brook specific resources, accessibility homepage, and Stony Brook University Student Accessibility Support Center, and some accessibility resources self created as well. Uh, also, just a little bit of advertisement of CELT's Inclusive Pedagogy course. It's a five-week course, online asynchronous course that we have, which is part of the Inclusive Pedagogy Milestone. So if you're interested in it, then just let me know or let us know. Um, thank you again for our participants, our panelists, and our CELT members. We really appreciate you being here and sharing your knowledge and expertise. If you have any questions or suggestions, then please email us. We also have a survey link available. We are always looking for feedback from you. So if you can just take uh, two minutes, it actually probably takes about a minute to fill out the survey. It will be really helpful for us. Special thanks to our director, Rose Tarota Esposito, and our vice provost for academic affairs, Amy Cook, and all of our CELT teammates who are actually here. Thank you so much for being here and your support. And thank you again, our panelists. This was very valuable. The survey link is in the chat. Thank you, if you can take the survey. I just wanna take this opportunity to Thank uh, Jenna, uh, Rose, uh, Jenny, Luis uh, for hosting this event. Um, and thank you to all the, the panelists, Sarah, um, Robert, Neil, and Sharon. Um, this is really an important conversation and I'm glad that we had the opportunity to, uh, to put this together. Thank you for being here, Glenn. It was really, really thank you. Valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And happy to participate in such an important conversation. Thank you.